Thank you all for joining another lecture for Interactive Computer Graphics. Today, we are going to talk about volume rendering. Ready? All right, let's get things started. Volume rendering. Yeah, that's our topic for today. So, why do we care about volume rendering? Well, actually, there are lots of reasons. It has so many applications, right? Let me show you uh, a very recent example. Check it out on i3D. Pretty cool, pretty cool results. It's about, uh, uh, it talks about, talks about denoising volumetric data. Really, really cool. But beyond graphics, yes, graphics, volume rendering, obviously we have applications in graphics. But beyond graphics, volume rendering has a wide range of applications. Uh, well, outside of computer graphics, for example, medicine, right? So we have a lot of volume data use in uh, for all sorts of medical visualizations are yeah, just examples obviously that says a, a, a big consumer of volume rendering particularly interactive volume rendering because you know, when you have a medical data like this you you want to be able to look around and, and see where things are at you don't want to pre-render them you want to look at them interactively so yeah that's a big consumer of interactive volume rendering um, Geology as well, like we have lots of volumetric data that could come from all sorts of different things and, and you want to be able to visualize them, scientific visualization purposes. Archaeology is another one, right? So you want to be able to analyze certain artifacts. Another one is material science and biology, basically you built all sorts of scientific data requires volumetric visualization and so yes real-time or interactive volumetric rendering is very very important also well in some ways computer science and engineering we have for example we have lots of simulations that we want to be able to visualize and look at them interactively so if there's anything going wrong with the simulation, you, you can see it live and, and you intervene, or you, you need them for analyzing your simulation data after the simulation is done as well, right? Another interesting one would be, would be lo looking at all sorts of data that, that is generated for various purposes. This is just showing the random numbers in space, for example. So like there are lots of, lots of consumers of volume rendering. And the reason why I talk about it is the type of volume rendering really sort of differs depending on the purpose, right? But nonetheless, it all starts with the, the same kind of idea. Like we have some data, the data could come from like multiple slices of some image. So you can think about this to some slices of a volume and you can, you can form some, some volumetric data out of that, right? And, and in the end, we would like to take this volumetric data and somehow generate some volumetric visualization out of that. Right? That's, that's the goal, right? That's what we're trying to do with, with volume rendering. And the type of visualization we generate, the, this final visualization that we generate, really depends on the goal. And depending on the goal, we, ha we can use really, really different techniques. So that, that's why I started with the, the applications. All right, so let's, let's talk about the sort of easy ways of rendering volumes using the GPU graphics pipeline. So one way would be just using slices. So, so here's what I mean by that. So if this is the, the volume data that we want to render, and this is going to be the final, that it's, well, I'm going to display the same thing in, in two different visualizations. So this is the, the volume that we're trying to visualize, right? And, and I can try to render this as like multiple slices, multiple slices through this, this 3D volume. And, and using something like alpha blending, which is something we talked about last time, we can generate images by rendering all these slices. I can, I can form an, an image like this from, from back to front, right? So that's the idea, the main idea behind rendering with slices. So basically, I have this volumetric texture, volumetric 3D texture. Okay, so this is how I store my volume data on the GPU as a 3D texture. 
and then for, for rendering it, I am going to take my, my volume and I'm going to generate some slices through it, right? And I'm going to generate those slices from back to front. And that's how I, so, so that like if my view is in this direction, that's how I would generate them. But of course, if I look at this, if I look at this data from a different view, this may not be the right order, right? Because we talked about alpha blending. We need to do things in order. We need to render these layers in order, right? I, I need to render them from back to front. I can also do front to back. It's front to back is also doable, but at, at least it, they, they need to be in order. I can't render them in random orders. Also, if I'm going to render these slices, I don't want to look at this rendering from, from this perspective, right? Because then I will just see through these, these planes. And that's, that's not what I want. I, I want to see something that actually looks like the 3D object, right? So uh, this is going to work. This sort of layer, layering will work only if I'm looking from this direction. From this direction, it looks fine. From this direction, not so much. So if I'm looking at it from a different direction, obviously I'm going to have to render it using different planes in a, di if in, in a different dimension, right? So I need to figure out where my camera is and from which direction I'm looking at it. And based on that, I'm going to decide which would be the ideal order to render things. But obviously this is not necessarily going to be perfect. Right, because there's going to be there's going to be some issues with it. Like, yeah, one of the issues is that when I'm looking at it from from this diagonal, none of the directions are perfect. Yes, but also, if you're not looking at this head on, things are not going to be perfect. So if I'm looking at this this volume head on, let's say this is my view direction up, then I'm seeing these layers one by one. Right, like this. Now, this, this is equivalent to sampling my volume data with a, with a particular step size, right? I'm taking the same step size through the volume. So I'm, I'm evaluating volume here, evaluating volume here, evaluating volume here, evaluating volume here. So I'm taking the same step through the volume. But if I look at it from a slightly different angle, then my step size is going to be different, right? Because the, the distance between these volumetric samples is going to be different in this case than in this case. So by just rotating it, by just rotating my, my volume, my sampling distribution in the view direction changes, which is probably not something that I would like to modify while I'm rendering because Sampling, sampling distribution here, so the, the step size D in this case, will determine the quality that I'm getting. If I have a lot of samples, I'm going to get better quality. And if I don't have too many samples, things are going to start looking like separate layers instead of one big volume. Right? And by simply rotating it, I'm changing my step size, which is not desirable. Of course, I could sort of compensate for that. So if you're rotating, you could just add additional layers so you can dynamically generate more geometry or less geometry, but that's not necessarily an, an ideal solution. There's a better way, right? So imagine that I'm looking at this volume through this, this, this end corner, right? So I'm going to render it from, from layers back to front, but there's nothing to say that those layers need to be axis aligned, right? They can just be camera aligned. So I can generate these layers that are aligned with the camera, camera Z direction, my, my view direction, and they don't have to be aligned with, with the object's dimensions. So they don't have to be axis aligned with the object's dimensions. They can be just aligned with the camera view direction. And if I do that, then these planes will look like this. You see that? They will look like this. So I'm, I'm just slicing through this volume a little bit differently. But of course, they don't look like squares anymore. They have different shapes because they're intersecting with the boundaries of the volume differently. 
but that's that's totally okay right because I don't have any data outside of this volume so I don't I don't I don't need the part of these planes outside of this volume so I can I can basically clip them which would be totally fine and based on my view direction I can adjust how I'm generating these these planes from different view directions I would get different uh, sorts of planes you'll see that there are different types of planes that that come out here so using those I can just render my my object my, my volumetric object so what I need to do is to generate planes from further away from the camera all the way to the closer to the camera and as I'm generating these planes I need to figure out how they intersect with the boundaries of the box right so what I need to actually render is going to be a little bit different so it's, it's going to be it's not going to be like regular squares anymore they're going to be geometries with different shapes so this they, they, they could be triangles they could be quads or different types of quads they could be pentagons or hexagons so there are all these different types of shapes that come out of this type of volume rendering one way to handle this could be uh, figuring this out on the CPU right before you render you figure out okay this is my camera direction that means I'm gonna render this many planes and and for each one of these planes you can figure out where it's intersecting with the boundaries of the box and, and generate this shape but that's not going to be very efficient right you, you can try to generate something like this for example in the geometry shader so you can just render a well you can just render a point I guess <laughs> just to specify where the plane is supposed to be and then in the geometry shader you can spit out exactly what that plane geometry is supposed to be and generate as many triangles as it needs to to form uh, any one of these shapes like whichever one is, is needed now that is a little bit nicer because well I'm not doing this on the CPU and there's going to be some level of parallelism but still it's not going to be it's not going to be super nice because I am doing this on I'm doing this on the geometry shader and each execution of the geometry shader may generate a different type of shape so there's going to be thread divergence it's not going to be ideal another approach would be just using custom clip planes so you can specify custom clip planes and say these are going to be my, my clip planes and and render them just like rendering regular squares just make sure that you draw large enough squares so they cover the entire box if they have to right so like it they're going to be cover the entire portion of the box that intersects with, with the volume area and I can render a, a quad that would be two triangles or I can just render a single triangle and that would be fine too right so, so I'm going to use custom clip planes and GPU will automatically clip the parts of those triangles and form the, the shapes that I need sort of automatically so I won't have to worry about that part but then but then I need to know for any fragment here I need to know the positions inside this this volume so that I can sample my 3d texture using those positions right and that's also fairly easily done so if I'm drawing a triangle that sort of extends and comes out of the the boundaries of this volume I'm gonna to have to place the vertices somewhere that's going to be outside of the volume but that's totally okay right because I, I can specify triangle positions that are going to be outside of this volume and that the parts of those triangles will be clipped and wherever I place my vertices I use the 3d coordinates in this object space as as vertex attributes and those vertex attributes will be interpolated on the GPU to find the positions that are going to be inside the, this volume for for each fragment right so if I specify the positions of the vertices that are outside of the volume the GPU will automatically do the interpolation for me and and I'm going to be done
right? So that's, that's going to be fairly easy. Actually, that's exactly what we're going to do for rendering quads anyway. So the rendering axis align quads. So nothing changes really. The only thing is that I'm set telling you that it's okay to set those attributes as values that are going to be outside of this volume. So if not my volume data is between zero and one, let's say in this object space, then my vertex positions can ha have coordinates that are going to be greater than one or less than zero, which is totally okay. So that's another way of doing it. So let, let, me, let me repeat again. So you can try to compute these shapes on the CPU. That's one option, which is not good. I can try to generate them inside a geometry shader by figuring out which one of these shapes. They're, they're not too difficult to generate, actually. There they're, they're ways to implement this on the geometry shader relatively easily. But you can do it on the geometry shader. That's a little bit better than doing it on the CPU, I think. But still, it's not going to be ideal because there's going to be quite a bit of thread divergence, probably. So, so, but it's doable. Another way would be using the custom clip planes that you can define so that the hardware does the clipping for you. So you render a triangle and the hardware does the clipping. And I'm going to tell you yet another way, a fourth way of doing this would be not clipping at all. So instead of these drawing these clipped planes that are clipped by the boundaries of the box, I just draw the full plane that's extending outside of the box. What happens then? Well, I can continue doing just the uh, alpha blending by returning an alpha of zero, right? Return an alpha of zero. So it's going to produce the correct result be because the alpha is supposed to be zero because nothing exists, right? So when you do alpha blending, you get the correct result. The problem is that we get a lot of fragments in places where we don't need fragments. Like imagine this plane, like this one, this tiny little triangle here. And if I don't clip the plane that corresponds to that triangle, then it's going to generate fragments for the entire screen, which is not what I want. I, I, don't, I don't care about the stuff that's outside. So all these fragments, yeah, they have zero alpha, so they're not going to be visible. They're not going to corrupt my visualization, but they're going to cost me something. Because the GPU will have to deal with them, the GPU will still have to do alpha blending with them, right? So one way to save the GPU at that point is to just discard those fragments. So in your fragment shader, you can say, if you're outside of the volume, discard. This fragment is gone, so it won't be used in blending. So that's, that's another way of dealing with this. So let's, let me repeat again. You can do this on the CPU, or inside a geometry shader, or you can use custom clip planes, so the hardware does the clipping for you, or you can handle all this in blending by returning zero alpha, or just by discarding the fragments when they're supposed to have zero alpha, all right? So probably it's a good idea to discard the fragments when they have zero alpha, although the GPU might be able to uh, do that sort of automatically for you. So it may, it may not cost you that much, but the real cost is going to be the fact that the fragment shader is going to be executed if you're not clipping these fl planes. The fragment shader is going to be executed everywhere, even places that you know that you will not need, right? So of all these options, the one that I would recommend would be using the custom clip planes. That would be the one that I would recommend. But if custom clip planes are not supported for any, any reason, the fallback option would be implementing inside a, a geometry shader. Or if you want to write a mesh shader for this, that also works. All right, enough about this stuff, I think. But the nice thing here is that when we're rendering, uh, I can set my sampling density easily. So if, this, if my slices are axis aligned, it's, it's going to be good. And if they're not axis aligned, then I'm still going to have this, I can still make sure that I'm getting the same difference with distance between levels. So I can get consistent quality that way. All right, so this was about how to use the rasterization pipeline to generate something that will look like volume, right?
So we have a 3D volume data and we generated something that looked like volume data, even though we're actually rendering just planes, right? Planes with some textures on them. Now the question is, let's say that I'm doing that, that part is not too hard, right? What am I going to do with those planes? And what am I going to do with my volume data? So if my volume data represents exactly what I'm supposed to render, then, then it's, it's good. But for a lot of visualization problems, that's not going to be the case. So my volume data is going to include some sort of data. Let's say that it's going to include some, or some value, let's call it some function f, some value f that it's trying to represent. I need to figure out a way to map that function f to some color and transparency value. Because this is, this is just for visualizing some data, right? Some data is this, this function f. And I don't necessarily want to see all of the function f because f has values that say it, it ranges from 0 to whatever. And if I want to sort of display everything, I kind of need to figure out how to map the F values to RGBA, right? Some RGB value in alpha. And that's going to be done using transfer functions. Transfer functions will take a function and convert it into some color value with some, some opacity, that some, some alpha value, right? That, that's, that's the idea. And this is like a, example super simple transfer function for you so this function f here is what we want to render and the meaning of f is really application dependent depending on what what it is that what kind of volume data you're visualizing this f will have different meanings all right what's important for us is to figure out ways to map this into some color value because color and alpha we can handle that right so the way it's typically done is that for some values of f, you pick a color and, and corresponding alpha, right? So in this case, for example, we said for values of f around here, we want red with a certain number of alpha. And of course, you don't want that to be a, a single value. You, you want to represent a range of values so that if f is getting sort of close to it, you can still see it and this will help with your with your sampling because if you if you're rendering multiple slices it's possible that if you pick just a single value it's possible that you will never see that value right but you'll probably see a value that's close to it so it's it makes sense to define a range instead of just a single value so for a range of f values we pick we assign a color and we assign a particular alpha to it so when we're given this, this volume data, we can convert that to a particular visualization for the thing that we want to see. So for example, this is just one slice through this, this volume data that's being visualized here. And we're just, let's say, looking at this piece. And here, the, the value of f is, this, this, this grayscale value is representing the value of f. Now, if I try to render this as volume, well, I'm going to have volume data everywhere, right? So this, this whole box of volume is going to be covered. I won't be able to see what's inside of it. I'll just see the outer surface, which is not going to be very helpful. But by using transfer functions, I can pick what parts of the data that I actually want to see, right? So these transfer functions here are picking these values and the parts of the volume that I'm going to be seeing that they're not going to be completely transparent are going to be these parts that uh, so this, this is going to be this is the alpha values so the alpha values are not zero or one as you can see there are values in between zero and one here which is good because i would like some of the layers to be semi-transparent and in the end i can produce a visualization that looks like this right so you can you can see through some parts you can see certain things so is this what you want to see? Well, maybe, maybe not. So it really depends on what the application is, right? So like what kind of, what kind of data is this and, and who's visualizing it and what would that person like to see? I'm looking at this data. Now I'm not seeing all of the data. Some of the data, you see not, not all F values correspond to color values. So I basically discarded some of the F values here. Some of the values of this function, they're gone. 
they're not visible here at all. Some of them are very clearly visible and others are sort of semi-transparent. And it really depends on what it is that you want to see. So there's, there's really no one function that just works for every kind of data. You kind of need to figure out what it is that you want to see. And that, as I said, that is something that the user will need to do because this, this function, this data belongs to the user who would like to see this data, right? And they kind of need to figure out what part of the data they want to see. So oftentimes this sort of volume rendering application will be accompanied by some interface that will allow the user specify that transfer function. For example, I can say that I want to, you know, I want these values to, to be white and I want, let's say, these values to, to be purple. And now over here, I want those values to be red. And now this is, this is the part of the data that I want to see. And from that, I can generate a 3D visualization, right? But it's important that this transfer function is done by the user, unless you have a predefined application and, and you know exactly what kind of transfer function you're supposed to use. Uh, you may want to have a, an interface that, that allows user to specify this. And this is going to be very, very useful for classification purposes, right? So you can say that, oh, this part of the data belongs to one class, this part of the data is another, and this part of the data is another. And you can, you can generate a 3D visualization out of that. Now let me show you a volume data uh, for a, a, a fully scanned, volumetrically scanned uh, person. So this is the volume data. If I just render it as, as like a normal volume data where I, wherever I have some data, I'm visualizing it. This is what I will see. Now, you're just seeing the surface, right? Not much else. But I'm telling you, there's an entire volume data here. For example, if you set your transfer functions just right, you can eliminate all the skin and, and the muscle tissue and everything, and you can just see the bones. You can, you can do that. that. That data exists. You just need to adjust your transfer function accordingly. And based on that transfer function, you can get one or the other. Or you can get a combination of them, right? So in this case, you're setting the parts of the transfer function that corresponds to skin a particular value with a particular alpha. So you can get this nice alpha compositing out of that. And, and that can be used for visualizing all sorts of data. Like if you were, if you just visualize everything where there's data, you get this, right? Uh, but if you just eliminate parts that are not really important, so you can get a nice 3D visualization like this. Like, is, th is this what you want to see? Like, you're, maybe, you know, this is the part of the volume that you want to see, which is, which is good. Or maybe you want to see through here and see inside, right? And you can adjust your transfer function accordingly. And you can, you can color things, of course, right? You can get different uh, color visualization uh, and, and, you know, see, see inside and, and, and classify different parts with different colors. Or you can, you can see through even, even further. And so it really depends on what you want to see. And this is, I've been talking about volume rendering for the purposes of visualization. So if you have volume data and you're trying to visualize it. This is not the only place where we see volume rendering. Uh, we use volume rendering in, in computer graphics for, for graphics purposes, in which case oftentimes we want to be able to render something that looks as, as real as possible, like smoke or explosion like that comes from some simulated volume data and we want to be able to render it well transfer functions won't help us here because what we want here in this case is that we want to see the appearance of what this thing would look like if it were real so then we need to think about light we need to think about lighting and how light interacts with this object with this volumetric object right and light interactions with, with volume data or uh, so-called volumetric scattering is quite a bit complicated, actually. So here are the kind of things that can happen. Now, let's assume 
that our vo our volumetric domain is represented by some particles in 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 the air, just particles hanging in the air. It's actually not a not a crazy idea to consider volumetric data as some some particles in the air. And imagine that this, there's this one particle, and I'm looking at this particle from from this direction, right? So that's where my camera is. I'm looking at it from this direction. So I'm seeing this particle just up in the air. I'm seeing, of course, in, in theory, <laughs> very, very large number of particles is what I'm seeing. That's, I'm, not gonna, I'm not rendering them as individual particles, but in theory, there are these particles hanging in the air. And for each particle, I, I, need, to, I need to figure out, I need to understand, at least, what kind of light that I can get from that particle. Now, if this particle in the air is like a part of an explosion, it could be emitting some light, right? It could be emitting some light. And if it's emitting some light, I will be seeing it. This, this particle is emitting some light, so it has some emission, and I'm seeing that emission, all right? So this, this emission in the volume will increase the amount of light that I'm seeing in that volume, right? So it will add to the light that I'm seeing in my camera. What if it doesn't have emission? It might also do, like this is a particle hanging in the air, it might also have some scattering. So light that comes to light that comes to that particle may scatter towards the camera, towards the view direction. We're gonna call this in scattering. So light, somehow light that's that's inside the volume is coming to that point. And, and it's scattering from, from that particle. Again, there are like very large number of particles. I'm not even rendering them. There's so many of them. But for each one of those particles, these are the types of things that can happen. It can, it can emit some light or it can scatter the light that's already inside the volume. Right? There's more. I need to think about shadowing as well. Right? So this particle in the air will also be blocking some of the light. So light that, that's coming to that particle, it, I won't be able to see all of it. Or sometimes this, this in-scattered light, it's you know, a, a part of it, even, even the part that, that's coming along the direction of the view direction, it's going to be blocked. So you can think about this as, as shadowing, what we call the term absorption for it. So like light is being absorbed by this, this particle and I won't be able to see it again. So that means that my volumetric data is not just going to be adding light that I, to my camera, it's also going to be blocking the light. So if there's something behind the volume data, obviously I may or may not be able to see it. So depending on the thickness of the volume data, like imagine some smoke, uh, if the smoke is thick enough, I won't be able to see what's behind it. If the smoke is not thick enough, it will block some of the light. It will absorb some of the light that's coming from, from behind the smoke, and I will be able to see some of it, right? So there's going to be some absorption. Also, there's going to be uh, outscattering. So light that's coming to the volume from outside is going to be scattered by this particle in all sorts of directions. So if I'm having in-scattering, then I should probably expect to have outscattering as well because it's pretty much the same idea that light comes in from one direction is scattered from another direction. So this is very much like our, our BRDF, like BSDF. Light comes in from one direction and a certain percentage of it is scattered in, in each direction. So depending on what type of volumetric media I'm, I'm dealing with this scattering, the scattering behavior obviously is going to be different, All right? All right, so the part that we often concentrate on is going to be this part, like emission and absorption. So let's ignore this part for the time being. So this, this more complicated in scattering and out scattering. Let's just, let's just talk about this emission and absorption. So. This means that my volume is going to either generate some light and I will be able to see it, or it's going to block some light. Some light that is either generated from, that's generated 
um, outside of the volumetric medium, but behind the volume data, or some light that is generated inside the volume data, the part of it is going to be blocked. All right, so let's talk about how, how this works. So imagine that I'm, that I'm looking from here. This is my eye. I'm looking at it. But I, I, I'm looking in the, the I'm, I'm seeing things from, from back to front. Okay, so S0 is where some light originates. How did that originate? I, maybe I had some object behind the volume data, or maybe this is in, inside the volume data uh, and, and there's some emission. But let's say that this is, this is coming from outside of the volume data. For behind the volume, there's an object, and, and this light that originated here with some intensity I, it, it doesn't, have to this doesn't have to be a light source it can be a light source but it can just be reflected light off of an object that's also fine right there's there's some light that i'm supposed to see if only i don't have any volume in between okay so if i don't have anything here just like our previous renders when we were not dealing with volumetric medium what happens is that I, I, I just see the whole light, right? So if this intensity travels all the way to my eye without changing. I, there's nothing in between to block the light, so I'm seeing all of it. But if there is some constant volumetric absorption, some absorption along this, this view, view, view direction, then a part of the light will get blocked at every step. Right? So at every step, a percentage of the light will get blocked. Next step, the percentage of the remaining light, the same percentage of the remaining light will be blocked. Next step, the same percentage of the remaining light will be blocked. So I'm going to have, like, at every step, I'm losing the same percentage. So this is not, theoretically, this is never going to go to zero because I'm not losing the, the percentage of the original light. I'm losing the percentage of the light that's arriving to that step, right? So always I'm, I'm losing some certain percentage. With every step, I'm losing some percentage. So this is going to be what's called an exponential decay, right? An exponential decay, that if I have constant absorption in a volume, that represents what happens to that intensity, right? So in this case, I have this function that, that determines the, the total extinction mm -hmm. along the ray. And that's going to tell me how much of the light will arrive here. So with an exponential decay, will give me the percentage of the light, the portion of the light that I will be able to see. And this is, again, assuming I have constant absorption along this new direction. And this absorption, of course, is going to be determined that this extinction is going to be determined by the absorption coefficient. So it's going to be an integral over from here to here. And if it is constant, this integral just, just collapses to a, a single value and becomes very, very easy to compute. If it's not constant, it's going to be a little more difficult, right? But if it is constant, this integral just evaluates to a single value and I can easily, easily evaluate it based on this, this distance and then, and then I'm going to be done, All right? Now let's assume that there is something else in between. Let's say that I have some volumetric emission. So inside this, this volume, it's not just smoke, it's kind of like an explosion. It has some light emission inside of it as well, right? So, so this, in this case, this point is emitting some light. So I'm gonna to have to emit, include that emission in here as well. So I'm gonna see that emission. But I'm not gonna see all of that emission as it is. That emission is gonna get absorbed as well as I'm, as I'm seeing it, right? So I'm going to have a similar type of exponential decay here. That similar kind of absorption is going to happen here for, for that light as well. So in here, I am seeing a part of the original light that's blocked all the way from there to here. And I'm seeing a part of, part of this light, right? So this, this becomes in total what I see. I'm seeing the combination of both of them. Of course, my 
volumetric domain can be such that there's some volumetric emission happening throughout this ray, not, not, just, not just at this point, in which case this is just going to be an integral or over this B ray. Okay? So this basically turns into an integral because I can have emission everywhere. Clear enough? Remember, we just talked about the, the emission and absorption part. So even, even that can get a little tricky. So how do we compute this? So let's, let, me, let me reiterate. Here's my camera. I'm looking at things. Let's say that my camera is, is in position X. Okay? And I, I'm just going to look at one view direction here. And in that view direction, I am seeing an object. I say teapot. Right. Let's say that object is at position XS. <laughs> X, XS. This is there's a surface behind the surface in front of the camera at that direction. And I'm and I'm my view direction in this case at this position, actually along along this, right, will be let's let's call it omega O. Right. So this is going to be my view direction. Now We've been doing rendering like this. You guys have done rendering like this. Like we, we know how to do this fairly easily. Like we just you know, do some shading here, figure out how much light is coming in here and just put it on that pixel for the camera and, and we're done, right? But since we're dealing with volume rendering, there's gonna be, <laughs> things are not gonna be as easy. We're gonna have some volume in between, right? And that's gonna mess things up, right? So let's say I have some light coming out from here. I'm gonna call this, light ls okay light coming from the surface if there's nothing in between i'm going to see all of it but because there's something in between it's going to block some of that right so there's going to be some light blocking happening here so because of that i'm not going to see all of this ls i'm not going to see all of it i'm going to see some of it and that some of it is going to be determined by, by this transmittance function. Right. So this will tell me what percentage of it will be visible. That's, that's all its job. It's just telling me what percentage of it is visible. Now, if I have constant volume, I showed you that earlier. If I, if I have constant absorption, this just becomes exponential decay. If it's not constant, it's a little more difficult, but basically becomes a, an integral of, of, of this sort. So it, it becomes an integral from z is the z direction, goes from 0 to whatever. So if I compute an integral along this direction, I'll be able to figure out how much of that position along this direction that I will be able to see. And if I evaluate this function all the way to the surface position, I can tell what percentage of the light behind will be visible, right? So that's, there's going to be that integral. On top of that, of course, I can have some scattering inside this volume, right? This volume is not just blocking light. It might be emitting light. It might be reflecting light, so, right? So all of that stuff is, I'm going to have to evaluate it for the entire, for this entire ray that goes through the volume. So for that entire distance, I'm going to have to compute an integral. And along that integral, I am computing the reflected light towards the camera. And that's going to be, of course, multiplied by the, how much material I have, like volume density. Uh, and it's going to be absorbed along the way, right? So light that's generated in here is going to be absorbed when it's going uh, towards the camera. So some of it is going to be absorbed. So this term and that term, they're basically the same thing. Uh, this is similar to the lights. Like it's like I'm, I'm shading volume versus shading surface. And this is the amount of material I have inside the volume. Right? So it's not a too difficult integral, but the very existence of an integral sort of complicates things quite a bit. And in this case, the, the z is going to be just some, some position along, along here. z is just a position along here. So 
uh, you know, Z, Z could be like a position like this, right? A and there, I am going to have to figure out for each position al along this, inside this integral, I'm going to have to figure out, well, there's going to be some light coming to that point, probably from outside, possibly from outside, and I need to figure out how much light is coming here and how much of that light that's coming here is reflected in the camera direction, and that's going to give me my L. And then I'm going to have to compute this integral for, for each position along the ray. So even this is actually, just, just this very simple looking term itself is quite complicated because this involves the, the, the light that's scattered in the camera direction, but it will, it will involve this term. Yeah, this, this little thing is actually this, this whole stuff. So this part involves emission. So a part of my material will be emitting light, right? And a part of it is going to be scattering the light. And, and that part that, that's scattering the light is going to have this, this what's called a phase function. And this is the light that is arriving to that point. So light started from this light source, went through this volume, and ended up here. It's going to be scattered by this scattering function. Now this is the VSDF. This is the bidirectional scattering distribution function. So this is the function that we're sort of more or less familiar with. It's, it's, it's like the material property of my volume, right? So I'm going to need this whole thing to be able to figure out how much light I'm seeing along this direction, right? So what, just to give you uh, an, an idea of what, how, what the complexity here, the level of complexity here, we've been just doing this. We've been just dealing with this term when we didn't have the volume. Actually, we didn't even have, have this volumetric absorption. We were just computing this, right? We were just computing this value. And this value is similar to computing this integral. Like if you include all global emission and everything, <laughs> this, this will be it. It will be that value, then this integral. So we're, this is a, the rendering equation that I've been showing you earlier about surfaces was just this, this piece, this, this integral. It's, this integral is equivalent to the rendering equation. Now I multiply it by the amount of material and add some emission. Of course, that can be added to the rendering equation as well. And that gives me this term, and then I need to integrate it through the volume <laughs> and also account for the volumetric absorption. That gives me the volume rendering equation, right? So this is quite a bit more complicated to, to evaluate, as you can imagine. Uh, now, how am I going to do this? How am I going to evaluate this? Let's, let's figure out. So, okay, we know how to do this, sort of. Like, if I know how much light is coming, to that point, which itself might be difficult, but let's say that I can do that. If I know how much light is coming to that point, it's just a you know, multiply by the DIDF kind of e evaluation. That, that part is relatively easy. Emission is easy. I, th this I can handle if I know how much light is coming to that point. Now I'm, that, so that means I know this term, but I need to evaluate this entire integral. So that's going to be the difficult part, right? I'm gonna to have to evaluate this integral meaning I'm going to have to figure out how much light is reflected towards the camera all the way through here. That's going to be the difficult part. So how, how are we going to do this? We're going to do that by using some sort of volume tracing. Now, one of the simplest, one of the sim simplest approaches for this is going to be looking at it step by step. Let's pick a step size, and, and with every step, I evaluate the value of that integral. All right, at, at every step that whatever's inside the integral, I, I evaluate it. That's going to be the algorithm that's known as ray marching. So inside this volume, this is not quite ray tracing uh, because we're not trying to find intersections with surfaces, but inside this volume, I'm taking some constant step. Right? So this is pretty much the simplest thing you can do. And of course, I don't necessarily have to reach all the way to the end of the volume. So it might be that this is a very dense volume that beyond a certain point, I don't really have much visibility left anymore, right? I don't see anything beyond that. So it's possible that ray marching will just 
terminate at some point here because when, after I reach here, there's no more visibility left. <laughs> like the entire visibility is already covered by all the stuff in here. That means that the material in here is going to be blocking everything that's beyond it. So I, I don't care to evaluate anything beyond that. So I can use uh, ray marching to evaluate that. Now this is not the most efficient technique, but it works and it, it, it works fine. The, the problem is I'm taking step by step and that can be a little, you know, it's costly. I need to evaluate the, the lights and, and, and shade every point here. I need to figure out how much light is coming to that point and, and shaded. So yeah, it's expensive. Like each one of these steps are expensive to evaluate. Uh, and, and also the quality will depend on how many steps I take. I would like those steps to be really, really small, but if they are too small, then I'm going to have to do too many of them. So it's going to be too expensive. So yeah, it's, there's, there's that, that um, difficulty with, with ray marching. But there is a what I say, uh, what I call a brilliant technique to, to handle this. It's called woodcock tracking or delta tracking. Here's how it works. This is going to do this completely stochastically. Instead of taking step by step, it's going to say, well, I'm going to evaluate this integral, right? And I want to evaluate this integral by taking n samples, some number of samples. So for each one of those samples, I don't want to I don't want to pick those samples step by step, but I can just randomly pick a sample along, along the visible part of, of this ray. So I'm going to pick a position along here randomly proportional to the, the probability that my view can reach there and with woodcock tracking. So I'm going to start from here. I'm going to just randomly pick a position along this, this viewing direction. And then I'm going to generate a ra another random position, right? And it's going to end up somewhere else. And generate another random position. It's going to end up somewhere else, right? And another random position and another random position. So like these are not going to be, these are not going to be equally spaced, but they're, they're sort of spaced based on the, the, the probability. Now, if I have constant density, this is very easy to do. This is some sort of important sampling. Uh, as I throw that word to you and say important sampling, I realize that we're not, we haven't really talked about important sampling in this, in this class, but it's just uh, making a, a way of sampling with, with better quality. So instead of sampling it with constant steps, I can sample it based on the volume density like this, which gives me better quality. Now, if I have constant volume density, I can do that fairly easily, not a problem. The problem happens when I don't have constant density, and oftentimes I don't have constant density. If I have constant density, it's not that interesting. Like it just looks like fog. But if I don't have just constant fog, I'm rendering something like smoke, it's not going to be constant. So if I'm looking at a view direction and I just plot the, the density, uh, the density of the, the volume data in here is just going to vary, right, as I'm moving along. And that's going to be hard. There is no analytical solution for, for this. If it's constant density, if I just assume that it's constant density, I do have an analytical solution. It just becomes exponential decay, super easy to sample, not a problem. I can do this if it's constant. I cannot do this if it's not constant. So here's the brilliance of Woodcock tracking is coming in. You see this part? This is the data. Woodcock tracking says, I'm going to fill this volumetric data with some fictitious volume. Just imaginary volume I'm adding there. It doesn't exist. Yeah, I know. But I'm, I'm, I'm adding more data here so that it becomes constant density. Okay. All right. How is that going to help me? Well, if it's constant density, then I know that I can analytically figure out how far I can go along this and so I can easily sample, sample this analytically. I can just randomly pick a position. I can pick a very good sample position. Very good. So this says that you know, I traveled along this direction and I reached that point. And at that point, I ended up hitting one of the particles floating in the air. All right. That's, that's what it means. Randomly, I picked a position. That means, oh, this particular sample 
ended up traveling through the volume and at, at this point it intersected with a particle. Now here's the question. Did it intersect with a real particle or did it intersect with a fictitious particle I added here? Right. Let's roll the dice and figure it out. So at this point, it's going to evaluate this, this density and roll a dice and say, did it, did it hit a fictitious particle or a real particle? Let's say that I roll the dice and ended up here. That means that roll the dice meaning I'm picking a random value. And based on this density, I figure out where I am. And if it corresponds to the fictitious volume, I say, you know what? It was not a real thing that you had. You need to continue. So again, assuming constant density, I continue. <laughs> and at that point, I reach another point. I roll another dice. Did I hit a real, real volume or fictitious volume? Fictitious volume. All right, continue some more. All right. At that point, I evaluate it again. Did I reach real data? Yes, this, that was real data. Okay, I can shade this point now. So this is how woodcat tracking would generate its first sample. So with that, it's, it's very efficiently able to randomly generate a sample inside this volume. Of course, it's just one sample. This is like, in comparison to ray marching, it's like ray marching with one step. Not good enough, right? <laughs> so you need to have multiple steps. But the thing is, you will not need as many steps as ray marching. So this, this becomes quite a bit more efficient because of that. Right. So, good, I can do that. How am I going to do this inside, inside my, uh, when I'm rendering with, on the GPU? Well, I can do all of that stuff inside a fragment shader. I can, I can e evaluate my woodcut tracking, ray marching, wh whatever kind of volume tracing that I want. I can implement it in a fragment shader. That's actually fairly easy to do. You can just uh, figure out where the volume starts and where it ends. You can, you can either do this analytically by saying, oh, where my box is, and so this is my fragment position, so I, I know where my ray would enter the volume, ray where would the ray would exit the volume. Or there are just, you know, some simple tricks you can do, something like render the backside of the volume, just to record how far you are from the camera, and render the front side, and when you render the front side, by looking at the difference between the front and the back, you can figure out how far you're traveling inside the volume. And, and based on this data, you can, you can figure out how much you, you, you traveled and you, you can do uh, some, some ray marching or woodcut tracking based on this. All right. So, but, or you can just do this analytically. The, the point is that this kind of volumetric ray, ray uh, volume tracing does not require any ray tracing support from your GPU. For a GPU that does not have ray tracing support, you can use a fragment shader to do this. GPU that does have ray tracing support, you ignore the ray tracing support, you do this again, <laughs> because that, that you know, ray tracing support will not be able to do volume tracing. It's not the same thing, okay? So it kind of looks like ray tracing, but this is actually volume tracing. So uh, yeah, we've been doing this for long enough uh, with all GPUs. We can, we can do that. The thing is, whenever I find a sample, I'm going to have to shade that sample inside the volume, right? That involves figuring out the amount of light that's coming into it. So if I just look at the amount of direct light that's coming to a point inside the volume, uh, that's going to look a little dark because a lot of times there's volumetric in scattering. Remember that we we talked about this in scattering. Light comes in and just scatters. Yeah, and and scattered light scatters again and then again and again and eventually scatters towards the camera and that's what we see. That's what we call multiple scattering. So if I just include lights that's directly reaching the light source and then scattered towards the camera, that's going to be single scattering. But light actually scatters multiple times inside the volume. Many, many times, and then re goes towards the camera. That will be multiple scattering. And if you can see here, just one additional bounce of scattering. So light comes to a point, scatters, and then scatters towards the camera. Just adding that makes a huge difference from single scattering to multiple scattering. Uh, in a lot of cases, 
it actually makes a huge, huge difference. And this is this is using four bounds that's that's even brighter than that, right? So multiple scattering is a thing inside volumes, and it's it's not something that you should ignore. You know, this looks very different than this, right? So this this whole integral on top of integral on top of integral I showed you earlier. There's actually one more integral that was hidden from you that was about multiple scattering. And that integral was a series of integrals, one for each bounce. So this whole volume rendering problem is actually a massive problem in, in comparison to rendering surfaces. Right? But there are things here that, that make this problem relatively easier than, than what it looks like if you just look at the math. Because a lot of this scattering is sort of, it's after a certain number of bounces, it becomes more and more uniform. So if you're using Monte Carlo sampling techniques of randomly sampling this elimination function, you don't have to use too many samples to estimate it well enough. That, that helps. So yes, this is a multi-dimensional, super complicated problem, but there are ways to approximate it relatively efficiently. It's, it's still going to be expensive, no question about it. It's st still going to be more expensive than rendering surfaces, but it doesn't have to be as scary as it looks, is what I'm trying to say, okay? Actually, even this single scattering here, even this guy, just figuring out how much light is coming from the camera, so, so how much light is coming from the light source to a point, just that alone is going to be it's going to be something. It's not going to be that that simple, right? So if I'm using ray marching to figure out, to find a point inside the volume, then I need to do another set of ray marching towards the light source and see if I can reach the light source, right? Because if I can't reach the light source, that means it's in shadow, like this bottom part here. If I can reach the light source, then I'm, I'm, I will be able to see some light and that light will scatter. So this brings us to this concept of volumetric shadowing or, or semi-transparent shadows. So if I have a volumetric data, I, I need to compute those shadows. And I can do that step by step using ray marching, or I can sort of stochastically try to figure it out using woodcut tracking. But of course, woodcut tracking would be just, just random. Probabilistically, it's going to give you the, the right result, but it's going to be zero or one. It's not going to be anything in between unless you do multiple samples of woodcut tracking. Another thing we could do is that we could pre-compute them just like shadow maps. So this is the idea of opacity shadow maps. Opacity shadow maps would generate a shadow map, but doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't quite look like a shadow map. Instead, it looks like, like this slices through the volume. For each slice, I am going to compute its, its opacity. Right? I, I'm going to compute how much material I have along each slice of the volume. And I can accumulate those slices together so that over here I have the total accumulation of all of the, the, all of the previous slices combined. That means at any point in this space, I can just look up that opacity shadow map value and that tells me how much shadow or how much light arrives that point, right? So that's the idea of opacity shadow maps. You basically accumulate the, the material density for each slice. And this has been used not only for rendering, uh, rendering volumetric data like this, but it's also used for rendering objects that should be considered as objects with semi-transparent shadows, such as hair. So we talked about hair last time when we were talking about, we talked about hair rendering last time when we were talking about transparency. And I told you that you know, it's, we're, we're treating hair as transparent pieces because they're, they're, hair strands are really, really thin, right? So from a shadow map perspective, they're going to be really thin as well. And it's going to be really, there's, there's going to be a lot of holes inside hair volume. So the light can go through those, those openings. Uh, so light can actually penetrate through the hair volume pretty well. So it kind of makes sense to treat it as volumetric data, even though it's not volumetric data, 
it kind of makes sense to use volumetric rendering techniques to figure out the volumetric to figure out semi-transparent shadows for hair. Right? Because if you use just opaque shadows, it it won't work. If you just use shadow maps, hair will look just dark. Right? The tiny little thin hair strand will just block a whole block of light for an entire shadow map texel. That's not going to be okay at all. So this is the idea of opacity shadow maps generating these slices. Uh, I did some work on this actually. I suggested an improvement on this and said, hey, if we're just rendering hair, uh, why not use a shadow map to figure out the shape of the hair and then we can generate these slices based on that shape. And if you generate these slices based on that shape, this becomes quite a bit more efficient. I, I call it deep opacity maps because it has that depth map in it and, and it's sort of deep, it's going, going into the material. So if you compare these two uh, with, with opacity shadow maps, you need to have multiple layers. If you don't have enough layers, like 16 layers, you see these layering artifacts because of the interpolation between different layers. If you have a lot of layers, well, you still have layering artifacts. If you zoom in, you can see them. Uh, but it, it looks quite a bit better. But of course, it becomes much slower, <laughs> right? Because you kind of need, need to deal with a lot more data. So with, with deep opacity maps, because the layers are shaped based on the shape of the hair, all this interpolation artifact, interpolation inaccuracies between layers, it becomes hidden. It's hidden inside the hair volume. The same sort of interpolation, layer interpolation inaccuracies exist here as well, but you cannot see them because they are happening inside the hair volume. And what you see on the surface does not have the interpolation problems. So we could generate images much faster like this using much fewer layers. This is uh, like a very common technique for rendering hair with semi-transparent shadow mapping today. Um, I'm going to show you this example. I, I really like this default. This is, this is one of the favorite things I modeled. Uh, anyhow, I, I was just looking for an excuse to show this. I'm, yeah, I, I like it. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything beyond that. I love this teapot. All right, let's move on. But this is just counting for the, the light that's, that's coming in. Uh, we talked about multiple scattering just briefly. Multiple scattering becomes very, very important for hair as well. So we extended this idea to computing multiple scattering in hair. So this is using single scattering. <laughs> Turns out a lot of the hair color that we see is a function of multiple scattering inside the hair volume. So if you just use single scattering, you don't quite get the right. Although, to be fair, this is not including semi-transparent shadows. So even forward shadows are blocked here. So it's just the direct elimination because it's single scattering. Uh, with multiple scattering, you start seeing the, the actual hair color. So it, it, basically, multiple scattering is actually very, very important for re rendering hair. And we extend it to this. And, and we could render hair with multiple scattering. This is an approximation. We, we could render hair multiple scattering in real-time frame rates. This is totally real time and it's not fake. It's actually computing multiple scattering proper, oh, approximating multiple scattering properly. All right, enough about hair, I think. So I'm gonna end this lecture by showing you a, a, a video of this nano VDB, that's um, NVIDIA's volumetric data structure that they've been using for rendering stuff on the GPU. So these seem like polygonal objects, but they're not, they're actually, that's volume data. Uh, VDB is a volumetric data storage format, and that's a fairly efficient uh, format using just a, a, few, a few levels of a volumetric hierarchy. You can, you can save a lot of storage space, so you don't have to store any data for the empty space. Um, and this is a, a version of the VDB data structure uh, that's allowing to, to store the volumetric data. And that helps with simulation uh, performance because you don't have to store empty empty volumetric data but it also helps with with rendering performance uh, and you can use it for rendering all sorts of things I, I believe this example is using some sort of a transfer function um, and this is using a volumetric object for doing collisions with a class simulation so this not necessarily rendering, but uh, the, the, the object here, I believe, is 
is represented using one letter. All right, so this is what I plan to talk about for today in the context of volume rendering. Next time, we're going to talk about GPU ray tracing, ray tracing API on the GPU. I'm going to give you the, the high-level overview of how, how that works. That's, that's the idea. All right, I am ending it here. I'll see you all next week. Bye.